Our third speaker is cardiologist Malhar Patel. Dr. Patel specializes in coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, geriatrics, and the use of pacemakers. He also serves as the fellowship director in charge of training cardiologists. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, okay, I'll just go ahead and just get started. So um, talking to Tajin beforehand, sort of outlined several questions for me to, to go through, and so I'll go through one, one at a time. The first question he asked me to go over is, what do I do on a on a day-to-day -day basis? And so I'm gonna to describe to you as a cardiologist, I have um, a few different types of days. And so I'm gonna walk you through what I do on, on these, well, you know, over the course of a week. So for example, I might have a day where I'm seeing outpatients. What this means is patients who are not hospitalized um, this is a typical eight to five job or nine to five day. I might see 15 to 20 individuals. Some might have a chronic illnesses that just need to be maintained. I make sure that the disease is quiet, the meds are safe and that they're, and that we provide counseling for them. Then I step out of the room, or I should say, before I go in the room, I review their chart. I talk to them, examine them, and then I do a documentation for about five minutes. When patients come in with acute illnesses that need to, that don't need to be hospitalized, I might, spend more time talking to them, tease out the various elements. It's like a puzzle. We then try to figure out the differential diagnosis. What are the different possibilities? What are the dangerous things that might be going on? Um, I'll use the physical exam and test to try to figure out what the cause might be. I might recommend a, a, um, a procedure or some kind of therapeutic solution. And that's also a lot of counseling and education that goes along with that. Out of my day, I'm going to meet new, new people. I'm going to meet people from all kinds of walks of life. And I'm going to see people that I've been taking care of for years. Um, I might know a lot about their personal lives, their family, their hobbies. Um, you know, you sort of form these sort of friendships over time. And a lot of doctors have an element of their practice where they take care and see patients over a long period of time. Uh, another type of day I might have is what I just finished off this last week. It's called, in, I, I call it an inpatient experience. That's a little bit longer hours. It usually starts, my day starts around 7 and ends around 7 or this week ended at 8. Um, on that day, I'm just seeing patients who are hospitalized with either life-threatening or potentially dangerous uh, problems that we're trying to figure out. I start my morning early in the ICU with my team of residents and nurses and pharmacists, and, uh, and we just start going through patients one at a time. Review their chart, their tests, their images. I'll talk to the other services, the nurse who took care of the patient the night before. We then walk in. Um, talk to the patient, figure out what, uh, counsel them about what we've learned, what we're finding, what we're gonna do next, how we're gonna get them from this sick state to something where they, they're feeling well and happy and doing, uh, and getting back to their normal lives and how soon can we get them there. Uh, it's also, that's a more challenging puzzle, of course. Um, we create a to-do list and then we follow up on it later that afternoon and you kind of do that for patient after patient after patient. I might see 20 patients on, on, on a day like that. On those days, it's a little not quite as organized because uh, when you're on inpatient, you're on call. If any emergencies come into the emergency room or in the ICU, or if uh, some on, on a patient on another floor taking care of, let's say by a neurologist or by uh, a, a, who has a pneumonia or whatever, they develop some kind of heart condition, then they want us to come immediately to bedside. So those days are kind of it'd be very much fly by by the seat of your pants and be very flexible to sort of adjust to the situation as it presents. Um, and occasionally, uh, when I'm doing that kind of thing, I have to be on call to, to come in overnight. If there's something when really sick and having trouble, then you want to make sure you go in and take care of that. And that's my inpatient day, kind of an intense week, but a lot of fun, uh, mentally challenging and gratifying being able to help people and sort of talk to them about it, about how to get them better. I might have another day as a procedural day. A procedural day is a little different than that. These, these are some patients I've known for a while. Some patients are referred to me for other things. So I will walk into the pre-op area, I will talk to them about the procedure, review, answer questions, counsel them about sort of the post-procedural planning, and, uh, and, then, and then I do the procedure. And it's, that one's not as much troubleshooting or puzzle solving, it's just sort of working with your hands and doing something in a very meticulous and careful fashion and just making sure everything goes perfect. Of course, if things don't go well, that is a puzzle solving uh, experience. But in general, um, that's, that, that's sort of an immediate gratification where somebody's going to leave there and feel better after having after spending some time with you. For each of these things that I, well, let me do one more day. I may have an imaging day 
where all I'm doing with my time is reviewing studies that other people have ordered. For example, uh, echocardiograms, which is an ultrasound of the heart. There'll be 80 different images, pressure readings, valve images, how thick is the heart, how big is the heart. And you're trying to figure out all these little subtle or obvious abnormalities so that you can answer the question that the ordering doctor and the patient have about why am I short of breath, why am I having chest pain, why, you know, whatever. And so, um, and, and in each of these aspects, outpatient, inpatient, procedural, uh, imaging, in each and every single one of them, um, I don't do it today like I did two or three years ago. Um, the field is so, so fast, it's so quick, it advances so, um, so progressively that you have to constantly be up on the latest and greatest, learn new techniques, learn the latest guidelines, learn the most recent research. And so really you have to be a lifelong learner who enjoys learning if you want to keep up and work at a very high level for, for your people, which we all want, want to do, obviously. The last thing that I do over my day is, uh, is teach. Uh, this is not what a lot of doctors do, but I'm part of a teaching program. And so a lot of what, what, what we, I just spend a lot of my time is, is helping doctors learn how to take care of patients, how to use a level head, how to have a little bit of emotional equipoise, how to figure out these puzzles in a very uh, efficient but thorough and meticulous fashion to make sure patients stay safe. And really teaching is one of the most fun parts of, of my job. It doesn't have to be just teaching other physicians, but nurses, teaching patients, that's what we do on every single encounter. So I feel like most of my time is education and counseling. The second part that uh, Tejan asked me to talk about is about um, sort of the educational background. Uh, well, actually, the next thing I'll answer, well, the next one I'll answer is why did I go into this? And why do, do when I talk to not just, um, when I interview applicants to our program, and we oftentimes talk about what drove them into medicine. And I think back on when I was in high school, I was 16 or 17, and um, you know, everyone asked me, what do you want to do with your life? And I, I wasn't really sure. And they would oftentimes offer me advice, and sometimes it was helpful, it was always well-meaning. Um, but what I found myself asking them is, what did, you, what did you, in retrospect, this is your retirement party, when you think back over your career, what did you find enjoyable, meaningful, what was the best part of your job as, you were, as you've gone through this? And a lot, at that time, a lot of the folks I was talking with were engineers. But they always gave me some kind of um, variation of, I feel like I made a meaningful change to someone else's life, to a community of people, to people around the world. Something I did positively affected somebody else. And they, in retrospect, when they look back, that's what they're most proud of, that's what they most enjoy, and that's what energizes them the most. And so I, I, I thought a little about that, and I, that sort of guided me towards medicine, because I thought that was a field that I could make the most impact and feel in retrospect that I've made the most impact on other people. Uh, I'd be happy to add, talk more about that, uh, about, you know, science aptitude and, and, um, and what, what kind of personality and what kind of traits are required for that uh, in the question and answer. But that's just, just the, the general. And most physicians I talk to have a, have a variation on that theme as well. So let's talk about the academic steps you have to take in order to get to become a physician. This is it's, it's the bad part part of this. So after um, four years of undergrad, hopefully, and not five, five years, let's say you do four years of undergrad, you do four years of medical school. Now you're a doctor, but you can't practice medicine and take care of patients at that point. And you do additional kind of apprenticeship. They go by the names of like internship or residency or fellowship or whatever. I'm just going to call them residency. And, um, they call it that because you kind of live at the hospital. Um, and those can take anywhere from three to eight years. So after you graduate from high school, it's college and med school is eight years. And then you do some additional training where you're actually practicing as a physician or learning how to practice as a physician for three to eight years. Cardiology, for example, that's six years. So it's a lot of time to sort of defer and delay um, you know, income and gratification and moving on with your life and actually doing what, what you, you know, of course, in medical school, you're doing what you want to do. So when you think about what you need to do each of the steps of the way, obviously in high school, you guys are already in the middle of it. You're trying to make sure your GPA is really good, doing your standardized testing, getting high scores, extracurricular activities, in order to go to a college. In the same way, when you go to college, you have to have really solid GPAs, um, you know, not necessarily straight A's, but but pretty close. 
Um, you're going to have to do your standardized testing, which is an MCAT at that point. You have to have extracurriculars, volunteer work, and some research. Uh, research is really valued in the, in the medical field, so you're going to have to have some experience of that over the course of your undergraduate. The medical school is the biggest sort of cutoff and the hardest step to, to make it into. Once you get into medical school, again, you want to apply to good residency programs. So your program quality plays a little bit more into play. Your you're not going to call it grades, but your performance on rotations when I'm mentoring an individual learning surgery or pediatrics or whatever, how well did they do? How well did they get along with patients? How reassuring were they? How smart were they? There's, again, standardized testing and letters of rec and research becomes more important. And so that's just to get into that now your fellowship. And after your fellowship, you can move on to either more training, which is what some people decide to do. And we could talk about all the different types of uh, different positions and how long, how long of a training each of those are, uh, or you move on to practice at that point. That is a lot of inform a lot of, uh, that's a, there's actually a lot more complexity to that, but I'm trying to condense it. But that's sort of the academic steps you need to take in order to go to medicine. It's a very uh, de a delayed gratification thing. The next question is what kind of hardships um, or challenges do we have to overcome? And rather than going through my own, my personal hardships or challenges, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the like generalities that I see amongst my colleagues. Um, besides just getting into medical school, which is a, 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 a relatively daunting challenge to perform at a very high level at, at undergrad, um, there's issues of money. You end up accumulating debt through undergrad, you end up accumulating debt through medical school, and then when you're in residency, you get an income, but you're, it's really just a living income. It's not something that you could use to pay back debt. So you have to, it, from a financial standpoint, you're, you're going to make money in the end, so it's a reasonable financial investment. But it's a, this deferred gratification, living in a, an apartment a little bit longer while some of your friends move on to, to houses in their lives, and you have to be okay with that. One of the biggest challenges that all physicians face, and, and everyone faces, I think, in their jobs and their careers, is a, is a work-life balance, is getting burnt out, is that uh, in order to achieve at a high level, you have to give, you have to give, and you have to make sure that that you sort of balance out your life on the other side. I think we've heard that from a lot of, from some of the other speakers. I think we'll hear about that for, towards the end of the day. I think that's a relatively universal problem and issue that a lot of us have to grapple with and have to find solutions for. And I find myself actually counseling a lot of our trainees about that specific issue. Last thing is sort of dealing with the pressure and some of the emotional adversity that you have to encounter. You're sort of uh, dealing with patients that some of their most vulnerable periods of time in their life. And so it's, it's sometimes you, there's a lot of attention to pay um, to, to their life and well-being. And sometimes there's a lot of giving and you have to sort of be very, um, you, have to be, be, you have to have that reserve to provide that for them. So what are some of my general advice for individuals? Um, you know, you have to be a learner. You have to love learning. You have to be a, a, a like, even though I'm in practice, I'm still taking recertification examinations every few years, whether I want to be a cardiologist or internal medicine doctor, or uh, I have to get my boards in echo and reading nuclear studies. And so I'm constantly studying over the course of time. I'm constantly doing my next exam. Those exams you just have to pass. You don't have to sort of uh, uh, blow them out of the water. They're not easy. And you have to spend time knowing your craft quite well in order to pass them. You have to be, you have to be, love teaching. And when I talk to physicians who get burnt out a little bit, um, I start talking to them about, about what is the, what is it, how do we maximize the things in their life that brings them joy? What is it about their day that, that makes them happy? And oftentimes what they talk about is somebody's going to do better because they showed up that day because there, something bad didn't happen to someone because they paid the extra attention to make that individual well. And that, that really provides a lot of us the, the energy to get through a stressful time. And uh, I would say for those of you who might be interested in field, field of medicine, I would discourage you if uh, the things that are driving you or maybe prestige or money, um, my friends in medical school, that, that was sort of a driving force. They really, they didn't find happiness in that field. But if, uh, if that kind of activity that I've described to you, um, that's sort of that personal connection that you make with people and those individuals and make sort of concrete and meaningful changes in, in someone's life on each encounter. If that's something that sort of speaks to you, I think this is a, I just have a blast every day. It's so much fun. 
And if I won the lottery, I, I, don't, I may not work as many hours, but I certainly wouldn't quit. I really, I really love what I do. Um, I, I thought I was going to take a lot longer. If I sort of blew through it a little faster than I thought. But hey, let's answer some questions. Can we go through the chat box and just go through one at a time? Uh, do you see the Q questions that people ask? Yeah, let me, let me go through them. Let's see. Um, Oh, which one, where, where did it start for me? Oh, here we go. Um, what are, all right, what are the things that you did through high school that help you achieve uh, what you are today? So I did a lot of things. I, you know, I volunteered at hospitals, um, homeless shelters. Uh, I didn't know any physicians in my life, so I, I didn't really have anybody to shadow. Uh, I, I would say in retrospect, if I had to think about what would help me because of this lifelong learner issue, um, I think learning how to study and even though I got good grades um, and I did well, uh, I don't think in retrospect that I was as efficient with my time and energy as I could have been. And the learning techniques I picked up just later in life, how to take high efficiency notes, how to figure out what the, what, what's, gonna, what's a testable material and what's not, uh, how to spend my, my time in a way that, that's gonna help me memorize things for the, the exam or problem solve things. I would have spent a little bit more time learning how to learn rather than, uh, uh, I think that would have been made me more efficient. But those other things are also very important. If you have some, there are programs that they have at a lot of these hospitals. I know Scripps, where I work, has them. I know UCSD and Sharp have them. But they have research opportunities. Particularly, they're done through the research um, field. So you provide a little bit of grunt work, paperwork effort for to help some a physician with their research. And as a payback, what you'll do is you'll be able to shadow them during their clinical time. So you can follow them around. And for anyone who might be interested in doing something like that, I think that, that would be really uh, really beneficial because you can see what the day in the life is. Because I gave you four different, or four or five different types of days that I have. There are, with every kind of field of medicine, there's just so many different kinds of ways that people practice. But there, a lot of them are variations on the themes that I had just, just described. It's kind of why I did cardiology. You get to do a lot of different stuff. Um, next one is, how did you decide to go into medical school, rather PA or nursing or anything else? I think e each of those things, uh, PA, nursing, uh, people go in and do ultrasound techs. They go and work in an angiogram lab where they are working the equipment. I think each of those things have all similar themes. And those themes are, um, you've made a difference in someone's life to help them get well and help them get better. Um, the reason why I went into medical school as one of those, as opposed to the other ones, is I felt like I, had, well, a, I felt like I had the aptitude to go to medical school. Uh, I thought I, I could achieve it, a because that is honestly one of the dividing lines. When you look at a, a medical team in terms of responsibility and in terms of decision making, the person who is making a lot of those decisions is the is the physician for. Um, uh, who might be supervising a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant or a resident or, or ordering certain tests or helping them that, uh, helping the sonographers interpret, uh, perform the tests, et cetera. And so feeling like you're the complete, indiv you're the, the individual who's sort of, uh, your mental energy and expenditure is what it is driving the, the care of that individual overall is something that really appealed to me. I wasn't sure if I wanted to take on the responsibility of someone's health. I think that's a really big thing to take on. Um, and that's, that's one thing that sort of me, that gave me a little bit of pause when I was thinking about going into medicine or not. But um, ultimately I said, well, somebody has to do these things. Someone has to be responsible and take care of people at that level. And so that's why I decided to go, go in, into, uh, specifically to become an, an MD, as opposed to the other numerous fields of healthcare professionals. That, that is all required to take care of these patients and get them to a point of improvement. Did I answer that, before I move on, did I answer that question? Or was there anything in addition you wanted to ask specifically about these other fields in, in the medical realm? Okay, so the next one is gonna be, what extracurriculars do you recommend for someone who's interested in the medical pro profession? Uh, in high, it's different based on the different levels. In high school, it's mostly gonna be volunteer work, I think. If you are able, if if you are able to do other things in the medical profession, that's great, but primarily volunteer work, uh, a little bit of giving yourself to society, whether it's homeless shelter, meals on wheels. I mean, a lot of you guys are already in it, but the similar stuff that, that you do to get into undergrad, that's, that's what you need to, need to do for, for that. When you're an undergrad, it's gonna be more important to do um, 
um, something that is meaningful, um, whether it's for the underserved population, whether it's for underrepresented um, or, or uh, under-treated pop, uh, pop, uh, individuals in our population, that's going to be a little bit more prominent. But in addition to the general societal needs that we have, um, the other thing you're going to want to do with undergrad is take a little volunteer time and to get involved in a research lab, to get, the, get into the process of research and understanding how to do that. And a little bit of research output becomes more important as you go through. It's, a, it's, it's relatively important in undergrad. It's much more important in medical school. It's even more important when you go into training beyond that. So um, the volunteerism, shrink, importance to get into a program, I mean, shrinks a little bit the further you go along. Um, you end up doing that as part of your job, and that, I think that's why that happens. But uh, getting, balancing the research and the and the and societal wellness is sort of what what uh, what are the two main things. What makes the field of cardiology special instead of other medical fields? Uh, I like doing. So I decided I wanted to be a doctor who deals with really sick patients, and that sort of narrows down the kinds of fields that you have to be. I liked. Everything. I really, I mean, I just enjoyed everything in med school. I like doing ob and I like doing pediatrics, and I like doing trauma surgery, and I like doing derm. I mean, I didn't need a rotation I didn't like. Everything's fun. I mean, everything's enjoyable. I like doing everything, and I like cardiology a little bit because you deal with really sick patients, and I get to do a little bit of something different for every single part of my week. I'll work in the ICU. I'll do some outpatient procedures. I have long-term relationships. You do procedures with media gratification to get to sort of interpret images, and it's just kind of fun to do all that stuff. So I try to pick a field that lets me do a, a lot. Uh, as a cardiologist, how much sleep do you get on average? So when I'm on, uh, I'm spoiled. Uh, I have, I'm in a training program, and so I get to sleep, and, my, and the fellows that I train have to stay up all night. Um, for most practicing cardiologists, um, when they are on call, it's not frequent. Um, when they do have to be on call, there is a balance in terms of how, who you have to go in for and who you don't. And most people get a reasonable amount of sleep at night. There isn't something where you are exhausted and you're you know, late in your career and you're spending every, every week, you know, one or two nights that you're up all night dealing with patients at the bedside and having to work the next day. That's not something that happens really anymore. There's a lot of balance when it comes to being able to get some rest. And so I don't feel exhausted or tired or things like that. Or I don't feel like I get enough sleep. Um, what's the most, uh, what jobs might help us go to medical school as young adults? What jobs might help you get into medical school? Um, are you talking about extracurricular activities or are you talking about, um, I don't, I'm not, I'm sorry if I don't, I don't quite understand that question. If you could add something on at the end, just explain what you, if you, jobs, you mean extracurricular, do you mean, um, uh, if, if you have to work to get through through school, what are kind of things that you could do um, as a side profession during your training to, to, to get into medical school? We could talk about that, but just add on that and I'll, I'll get back to that towards the tail end. What would you consider to be the most difficult part of a cardiologist's career based on your own personal experience? Uh, it's the hardest thing is just getting in. It, it's really hard to, um, to get into medical school. The other thing I find very hard is, um, I, find it, I find it a challenge to get a work-life balance. That's, that's not my challenge as much, but when I look at my colleagues, it's, there's a, you want to be helpful. So you want to be the yes person. Anyone needs help? Yes, I'm here to help you. But as you do that, it's ju you just end up giving more and more of yourself to others. And you have to save a little bit for your family. You have to save a little bit for yourself. Um, it's part of work-life balance that every single speaker today is going to tell you that they have to work to achieve. I think the most difficult experience for all of us is sort of balancing work with everything else. Um, what are, uh, but I don't find the technical challenges of working a, a challenge. I just find that a lot of fun. These puzzles that you have to, I can't figure out, working hard to sort of get some answers to that, all that to me is just a blast. So I don't have, a, I don't feel, and I don't find it difficult to deal with patients towards their, the end of their life if everything has been done appropriately. Um, we want to help people live as long as they can, as well as they can. And when we can't help them live better, then it's our job to sort of make the end of their life as comfortable and pleasant and as um, uh, you know, as free of, of hassle and free of discomfort as possible. And that's still a blessing to be able to provide that to individuals. So I, I don't find that a, a difficult thing either. That's actually a, it's not a pleasurable part of the job, but it's my pleasure to take care of somebody and help them in that situation. 
uh, what classes in high school, uh, what classes in high school helped you as undergrad or med school? What classes would you recommend junior seniors take if you want to go in the medical field? Don't worry about that stuff it's because it's such a long um, process. You don't have to take specific classes um, for that. I had a lot of my college, my co-medical student uh, students. They did uh, undergrads in um, theological sciences and Russian literature, and you know they have to do certain minimal requirements for um, to get into medical, certain amount of sciences, uh, you know, etc. But I wouldn't say there's specific classes that, that you need. In general, the the things that I find to be the most the best individuals that go into this field are well-rounded. They have a diverse amount of interest and they have a diverse amount of, of things that they're interested in. If I had to say as a theme, what you should, should you go into is mostly things that help you problem solve. Problem solve and analyze whether it's literature or whether it's the sciences or whether it is uh, non-medical sciences. Those kinds of ways to think and work through a problem and become organized in your approach is going to help you no matter what field you do. I think a lot of the training the apprenticeship comes in residency and medical school. I think undergrad, what I think help, would help people the most is just helping them figure out how to think. And the more diversity you, ex you could expose yourself to, rather than narrowing your focus, is just going to help you be a better thinker in general. And I think in general, that makes you a better physician, makes you a better person. What's the most fascinating advances in cardiology that you've encountered over the course of, of the career? Oh, gosh, I mean, there, I don't know if there's time for that. Uh, I don't do... I don't, in my day today, I don't practice like I did five years ago, much less 10 years ago, much less 13 years ago when, when, I, when I finish. I do things differently constantly. This whole cardiology field of, of genetic evaluation for patients, of moving from open heart surgery to uh, minimally invasive surgeries where you don't have to use incisions to fix people's valves, to um, this whole field of mechanical circuitry support where patients' hearts aren't beating anymore. So using mechanical devices in order to keep their heart going as a bridge to transplantation. I mean, there's just, I, I don't know if I, would, if I could get to the end of the fun and fascinating things that this field has changed. And there's a, a bunch of stuff on the horizon that, that, is, that we're constantly stimulated with about the, the changes. And that's not just true in cardiology. It's true in most of the, the fields. I think it's a lot of fun. How, do, how, do, how does pediatric care compare to adult care? In, in, two, in a several different ways. First of all, if you go into a sub-sub-specialty in pediatrics, infectious disease, pediatric cardiology, a large section of your time isn't just taking care of patients, but in the peds fields, a lot, of, a lot of what you're gonna do is research. So that has to be a driving force for a lot of folks. Whereas if you're doing general pediatrics, almost all of it is actually the patient-to-patient -patient interaction. And so there is a lot of fun to be had in, in pediatrics, um, but depending on what kind of subspecialties you want to do, there's a lot. It's there's a lot of differences. Pediatrics is just a huge field, and all the subspecialties you can imagine: pediatric neurology, and pediatric surgery. And gosh, it's a, such a hard hard way to compare it to to um, to uh, to anything because there's so many opportunities there. I'm not sure if if I know how to ex explain that any better. I don't feel it's 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 different in the problems that they have, but I, I love talking to kids and dealing with young kids or teenagers just as much as I like talking to people who are in their middle age or sort of in their end of life. I have a bunch of patients who are over 100 years old. It's just, it's fun taking care of everyone. What are some of the extracurricular jobs to help you get into medical school? Extracurricular jobs during high school that's gonna help you get into med medical school. Oh, that's not, don't worry about that. <laughs> there's, no, there's no one in your medical school application, they're not gonna look at what jobs you did at work uh, what you worked at in high school. For example, if you want to be a, a lab tech where you work at, at helping them set up their glassware and keeping their, um, their, uh, their, electro their research equipment uh, sort of in tip-top shape, that's not necessarily going to help you get, get, get into that medical school. I wouldn't stress out about that too much. Plenty of time to get stressed out on other stuff. What major would you say is most beneficial to get into medicine? Again, this is something that there isn't a beneficial one. People will pick one of the biological sciences because the requirements for the major overlap with the requirements for medical school quite nicely. So if you do something like my friends did Russian literature, they don't have a lot of science re requirements. So they had to do all the requirements for their major and they had to do science requirements on top of that. So for some of them, could, could that push it from four to five years? It might, um, but there are so many different majors within the, within the sciences that, uh, that any of them would be fine. Uh, any of the bio, whether it's psych or biochem or um, 
or microbiology or just any of those things, they overlap quite a, quite a bit. The, there isn't a great major that people choose in order to get in, in a medical school. I would say, just like anything else, if you're gonna spend four years doing it, pick something that's really fun and interesting to you. I did microbiology and molecular genetics. This is not something that I chose as a, as a career, but I was really fascinated by that when I was in, um, when I was, I was in, in high school as that field. And so it was fun. I knew that wasn't gonna be my career, but if, if I had to have a major, it was fun to do that for four years before I moved on to medical school. All right, I hope I answered you, any of your questions. You can always um, uh, reach out to Tajin if you have any, if you have a specific interest in medicine and you wanna ask any for other questions, I'm happy to answer that offline or at a later date. Thanks for doing, thanks for putting this on um, uh, everyone here. Thank you so much for your time. And